This is our 19th annual uh, health care conference that has been sponsored by the Department of Insurance each year with a couple of hurricane exceptions since 1992. We'll have over 600 attendees here, uh, lots of folks interested in insurance issues, health insurance issues, including producers, agents as most folks know them, consumers, company representatives, etc. It's an all-day dialogue. Uh, we have the expert, in my judgment, on PPACA in the United States. Brian Webb has come down from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, uh, where he is the point person for all 50 states and their regulators on all of the multifaceted issues that are arising out of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. We'll be doing this all day. We have the CEOs of all the major health insurers doing business in our state on a panel. We have a representative of the Department of uh, Health and Hospitals to talk about Medicaid issues uh, affecting our state and how they will also affect insurance coverage for many of our uninsured going forward. So these issues that have been front and center now for three years uh, will be addressed in an all-day presentation by all of the experts in that field. Since last we met, the Affordable Health Care Act became real law as deemed by the United States Supreme Court, who in effect said that the mandate to purchase or get coverage for health care insurance in this country, or health care in this country, was not a penalty but a tax, and that Congress indeed had the authority to legislate, but also uniquely found that states could not be constitutionally coerced to ex accept 100 percent federal fund match for first three years of having to adopt an expanded federal Medicaid program for a population of uninsured up to 133 percent of federal poverty. Where does that leave us today? To my partner and dear friend, Dickie Patterson, whom I asked yesterday, how would I open this meeting today? Oh, God, how are we going to do that? He said, that's how you're going to open the meeting today. Oh, God, how are we going to do this? Today, national health care spending, in February at least, was 3.9 percent higher than a year ago from 4.1 percent in January, but was, believe it or not, for the last decade, a record low recorded in terms of increases. Hospital spending went down 6 percent from a year ago, although one in nine jobs are created in the health care industry. Employer-based coverage declined over the last 10 years, from 70 percent of all employers affording some kind of health care coverage to 60 percent today. And we believe, on average, that the decline will continue. Average employee premiums have doubled over the same period. Today, on average, per person, $5,081, or an increase of 125 percent, $14,447 per family, average family of three. That's today minute by minute, and it will change minute by minute. Well, where did we come from? The Louisiana Health Care Commission, who sponsors this program with the Louisiana Department of Insurance, was created by the legislature in 1992. We now have approximately 46 commissioners representing providers, health insurers, employers, labor, consumers, government. Pretty disparate group of people that somehow get in the same room, meet on every other month, and find common ground to study complex issues in our state and to look for possible solutions to address the growing concerns about access, quality, and cost. The seminal event in our history as a health care commission and in the history of the Louisiana Department of Insurance was no doubt Hurricane Katrina followed closely on its heels by Hurricane Rita in 2005. What happened as a result of this horrendous disaster? 
recovery, response, and renewal, and a redesign initiative for health care in our state, recognizing that among the institutions that was horribly broken and fragmented, health care needed to be looked at, needed to be redesigned, needed to be reformulated. And so it stimulated our need to look at ways of reaching out to our citizenry in Louisiana in order to focus on a system of care pre-disaster, pre-needing health care, and post-health care in a catastrophic world. And so our safety net hospitals that were owned, as it were, by LSU, which is an educational and a medical education system, needed to relook at returning to its mission of education, of health care, uh, health care professionals in the future, instead of rendering health care services in an environment that needed overhaul. And so we're going to talk about today the changes in a public-private partnership environment of taking our 11 safety net hospitals and transforming them in the same way that we attempted to transform health care on a national, state, and local basis. As you know, this is an incredibly significant time for health care in our country. The next five years will see dramatic changes in how health care is delivered and paid for. The question is, first question is, will it remain an employer-based system? People need to engage in this process with their health care provider, legislator, and congressional representative, and with us at the Louisiana Department of Insurance so that we can help, so that we can help guide them through the process. Today, we're going to hear from a range of knowledgeable speakers who will address the latest news and changes in health care. Of course, some of the topics you hear most frequently about in Louisiana involve Medicaid, the LSU Health System, and the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Oops, I refer to it as PPACA. We'll get right into these topics this morning with presentations from Carl to Lynch from the Department of Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals. I want to talk a little bit about the changing landscape of health care here in Louisiana, but from our perspective, as well as from a national perspective. At the Department of Health and Hospitals, the last five years have been a very transformative time. We've gone from over 15, uh, 12,000 employees to a little under 6,000 employees in that time, a 53% reduction. And that's primarily associated with shifting our role as a government in healthcare from being a direct provider of services to being an overseer body or a policy maker, ensuring quality services are delivered, being a financer of services. And that's a, that's a shift that's occurred across the country over the last 20 years and one we have in some cases been a little late to the game to. We've seen uh, both the closure and the privatization of many of our healthcare facilities that serve people with developmental disabilities, as both we've looked to community providers to provide those services, as well as have shifted individuals to more uh, inclusive settings in the community. We've seen uh, the similar uh, functions playing out in our public health units across the state. As more of our children have gained insurance, both through Medicaid and through the private market, we've seen demand for some of those services decrease. That's why in our most recent budget, you saw a shift in the way we deliver vaccines for children in our state uh, to bring those back to the medical home of the individual child instead of providing them to the public health units. We've seen that happening uh, with, uh, with our mental health hospitals in the state. We used to have uh, several more than we do today. They used to house thousands of individuals. There's been a big shift across the entire country as we've looked at serving people with mental health uh, problems in the community rather than institutional settings. Um, and we continue to see that happening today with the, uh, with the private public partnerships that are playing out in the LSU healthcare system that I'll talk about. But that's been a transformation that's been occurring for some time. And like I said, in many ways, Louisiana was a little late to the game, too. Across the country, safety net health care services are often delivered by private partners in the community. They're often financed at the, and governed at the local level rather than the state level. And they're often done as a partnership between the state, local governments, and community providers. Um, we know that in many cases it's not, it's not efficient and it's not the best outcomes to serve individuals in an entirely separate tier of health care, which is why we've begun looking at trying to integrate those safety net services into the existing community pro providers that service all today. And that was an impetus not only that came from a policy making function, but also from a congressional action that occurred last summer, as you all remember, 
there was a sudden change in the way Medicaid uh, was financed at the federal level in Louisiana that led to almost a billion dollars being removed in the current fiscal year after we had already passed the budget. That led to very quick action uh, to bring the budget, budget into balance as we are constitutionally required to do. And that is what led to the quick succession of the LSU system over the last several months. And that strategy is focused on developing those key partnerships in each community. It's gone community by community looking at what does it make sense for that region, who is the logical partner for that hospital, and how do you best move forward to serve that community. Um, to yesterday actually marked an incredible day for th that progress as we brought closure and transition at Earl K. Long to Our Lady of the Lake in Baton Rouge. Those individuals that previously sought care at Earl K. Long are now being seen at Our Lady of the Lake. Um, we were on site yesterday. Uh, Our Lady of the Lake did a fantastic job through that transition. Those medical residents that were previously uh, practicing at, the, at Earl K. Long are now integrated into the academic programs at the lake. Individuals that would have sought emergency care at the, at the Earl K. Long were being treated at the lake. The new 24-hour, seven-day-a-week urgent care facility that's operated by the lake opened in North Baton Rouge, just a block from Earl K. Long. Uh, that transition for us has been years in the making, is the credit to many individuals, hours of hard work and planning to make that a successful transition. Um, we'll continue to work with the lake, with LSU um, as the healthcare financing body to ensure that the, that transition continues smoothly as, and as we look forward to the next phases in this process. Uh, this week. Uh, in, Bat in New Orleans and Lafayette. The Board of Supervisors will be looking at cooperative endeavor agreements for those facilities to bring those partnerships to, uh, to finality. We continue to progress with our other facilities uh, in Homa and Thibodeau at Chabert, uh, who's partnering with Ochsner and, and Terrebonne General. Uh, we continue to look at Bogalusa. Or we continue with our partnerships in the north with LSU Shreveport. They've selected the Biomedical Research Foundation, a local private nonprofit, as its logical partner for the hospitals in Monroe and Shreveport. Uh, moving forward with, ex with uh, developing a cooperative endeavor agreement, they've launched a public input process through a website where they can solicit feedback from employees, from uh, medical practitioners, and from the community about progressing that partnership to, uh, to completion. QEP Long in Alexandria continues to, uh, to work with uh, Rapids and Christus on developing a partnership for that community. Uh, and we also continue to work in, uh, in Lake Charles with Moss and, and developing a partnership there. Our goal is obviously to bring all these to a close by the end of the fiscal year. Um, Lolly Kemp will continue to be a state-run facility after that point. Uh, and we're continuing to work with the Department of Corrections uh, on, trying, on, on a plan forward for prisoner care. Uh, in many states across the country, uh, we know that prisoner care is something that is uh, handled through the Department of Corrections. It's financed at the state level. Obviously, there's limitations on, on federal funds that can pay for those services. And we look at ways that we can purchase that care more effectively, more cost effectively for taxpayers uh, in a way that makes sense for that system as well. There will be an exchange on or about October 1st of this year. Uh, that will be selling products and beginning January 1st of 2014, anything sold after that date will dramatically change. Uh, what, what consumers can access, the information they get, uh, what the, everything costs will dramatically change uh, next year. So we have to prepare for that. And what I'd like to do today is just talk a little bit about where we're at and where things are going over the next few months as we prepare for those exchanges and for the reforms coming up. What's going to happen January 1, 2014? And the answer is for the individual and small group market, a lot. It's going to drastically change. And this is the way I always explain it to people. And sometimes some, certain people get offended by it, but it's, it, to me, this is reality, so I'll say it. Under our current system, you make money. You are successful by avoiding risk or pricing for risk. So if you're higher risk, I'm going to charge you more. If you're a risk I don't want to take, I don't have to take you. That's the way you succeed. That's, that's your business model. That can't happen anymore in the individual small group market. Instead, you're going to make your money. You're going to be successful if you can manage the risk that you receive, because you can't control it and you can't price for it. So that's where we're going, because any plan sold or renewed after January 1, 2014, these rules apply. Guaranteed issue. 
Somebody walks up and says, I want this coverage. What do you have to say? Here you go. If, it's in the, if it is during the open enrollment period or a special enrollment period, like you're coming off coverage from an employer or something like that or a life change, those kinds of things, if it's during that time, then you cannot be denied coverage. They have to say, yes, which one do you want? You can't limit which option they can take. You have to say, any plan I offer, any plan out there, I have to give it to you. And even more important, there's no pre-existing condition exclusion. And this is new for small group. There is going to be confusion. Uh, people aren't going to be quite sure what to expect. Uh, what's going to be available will be confusing to them. That's why we need so many people who are trained and understand, people like those here today, uh, the agents, the brokers, the, those involved in health care, uh, to be able to understand the program so they can give the consumers the information they need. That's why things like this are so important. What kind of an impact do you think that the Affordable Care Act is going to have on the uh, traditional insurance market, the people that already have insurance? Uh, there's going to be some changes. Uh, they'll have more options, of course. Uh, they won't be locked into a plan if they happen to have uh, some health needs. There will be more options available to them to buy. There will be subsidies available for many of them. But also there will be some who could see their rates going up uh, because they've you know, been able to take advantage of some of the current system's uh, rewards. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of changes, a lot of confusion, even for those who currently have it. First of all, telehealth is not the medicine of tomorrow. It is the medicine of today. We have the technology and the application, we just do not have the usage in Louisiana that we should. And the second thing is uh, telemedicine is probably the best kept secret in Louisiana. You know, if Pfizer would have stocked the pharmacy uh, shelves with Lipitor and did nothing else, it would not have been the best selling medication in the world. Instead, you saw an army of professional drug reps and uh, an avalanche of advertisement is what led to their success. So what I want to just tell you a little bit about what we, we're doing in Louisiana right now and what we need to do, and then I think you're going to be excited to hear the next speaker who's going to tell you how it can be done. In the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, with New Orleans underwater and LSU Shreveport overwhelmed with patients, I got a call from Dr. John McDonald, who was a chancellor of the Health Science Center there. Uh, I was president of the Senate, and naturally he was calling me for money. Uh, but Dr. McDonald told me they were running 101 percent occupancy. They had uh, stretchers with patients lining the emergency department waiting to be admitted. And he wanted to come up with a program that would reduce unnecessary transfers to the medical center, to shorten admissions and send patients back to their home hospitals to get continued care, and to reduce the duplication of laboratory examinations and x-rays, CT scans, et cetera. So I referred him to Linda Welch with the Royal Hospital Co Coalition, and between the three of us, we came up with the LARIX program of the Louisiana Rural Health Information Exchange program. And since South Louisiana didn't have a referral base, we started this program in North and Central Louisiana. And we have uh, 21 hospitals that do outpatient consultations with the, with the Health Science Center in Shreveport. And these patients can stay in their home locale and be examined by specialists in Shreveport and uh, re recommending uh, treatment to their treating physician. And this is done through the use of this telemedicine card. As you see, there's a camera at the top and a screen with uh, interactive audio video where the patient can see the physician, physician can see the patient, and they can converse with each other. At the bottom shelf, you see a stethoscope with some earphones and that, that has been improved upon, and Paul will tell you a little bit about that. It also has an otoscope, and on the first shelf to the right, you have a derm camera. It's a high-resolution camera that actually dermatologists say they can make a better diagnosis with the picture from this camera than from their naked eye. So it allows, it can do everything but 
palpate. The physician can tr examine a patient and can do everything but touch that patient with this uh, piece of equipment. We plan in the very near future to uh, begin a network in South Louisiana uh, and tie that up with LSU New Orleans and hope that we can have uh, the beginnings of a statewide network and tie LSU New Orleans and LSU Shreveport or their, their remnants of whatever remains of them together uh, in the near future. We also uh, got a grant uh, to do telemammography in these six locations in, in North Louisiana where we have a van that goes by and it does uh, mammograms on uninsured patients and through the use of the T1 line, the same lines that we use for telemedicine, those images are sent to the cancer center and a radiologist reads uh, the mammogram while the patient is getting dressed. And when the patient comes out of, out of this van, they're told, Ms. Jones, your mammogram was normal, come back in a year, make an appointment for a year. Or Ms. Jones, we found something that needs further study. Where will you be at noon tomorrow so we can give you an appointment for a diagnostic mammogram. And we found this to be very useful because a lot of the low-income patients uh, have difficulty in, in reaching them and making giving them instructions and so forth after they leave uh, the unit. And it's worked out very well that this uh, real-time examination, in fact, I, I don't know of any place in the United States that is doing this right now. I know up in Seattle they were doing it, but they were beaming it off of a satellite and it got way too expensive and they quit. Now there might be some places that have come up in the last year, but I, I think this is the first for Louisiana. I've come up, there's a mission in the mountains of Guatemala near Guatemala City that a Louisiana resident runs that has about 450 children that he takes care of. Most of these children are there because of abuse, abandonment, or neglect. After about six months, this fellow, Dr. Mike Clark, he's a PhD in education, not a physician. He and his wife adopts these children so that the courts or their families can't take them back into the hostile environment for which they came. It's a fantastic thing. Since 1989, he's cared for 4,260 children. He has 465 residents as I speak now and uh, 97 children in college that he's supporting. Well, I got the idea, what kind of medical care are they getting? And I, I called Dr. Clark and he said, well, they had a little clinic with two nurses. And I said, what about a physician? He said, well, a doctor stops by about once a week. What do you do in the interim? Well, if we get a seriously ill child, we send them to a public hospital, which is about a five to seven hour ordeal to get them seen and treated. I came up with the idea of putting a telemedicine card in their clinic, and Paula Guy and her group generously donated that equipment. It's being shipped to Guatemala as we speak. They, what about physician coverage? I talked to Dr. Olie and the LSU Health Science Center in New Orleans has agreed to provide the medical care. Then I, I raised the money to do all of this, and then I got to thinking, if we made a diagnosis of a strep throat and we don't have antibiotics to treat them, what have we accomplished? So I'm in the process now of raising some money for uh, medication, and also they have one other crying need. They have five children aged five to 12 who are on dialysis, no hope of kidney transplantation. Uh, they're just there till they die, but to make them comfortable, but they have inadequate and inefficient equipment. These kids are having to go to dialysis four times a day so we came up with a deal with uh, Baxter Laboratories. They reduced the price from $7,000 to $4,000 a month. These children can get eight hours of dialysis at night, have 16 hours of quality time, plus they're going to live longer, and who knows, maybe through our association with LSU, maybe Children's Hospital or whatever, we might be able to find donors for them before they die. But anyhow, I think this is a great application of telemedicine, and you see that it has tremendous possibilities. If any of you want to get involved in the Guatemala Project, you can call me at 318-346-7500, or you can email me at drdonhines 
D-R-D-O-N-H-I-N-E-S, all one word, at AOL.com. I hope after you hear this today that you will all leave here champions about how we can use technology. It's not about technology anymore. We all have our phones, we all have our iPads, and literally you can connect. I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Of course, you know technology is technology, but I, hopefully it's gonna work really well. I'm connected on a 4G card, so it's not even gonna be about connectivity anymore. And you can connect to a doc just like this, and he can see your images, uh, he can make diagnosis, um, and it's so exciting. So I want you all, to, especially in the insurance um, industry. You all need to know that this is the most cost-effective means to me in accessing health care for um, your members and for all of our population and even in Guatemala and in the uttermost parts of the world is the way I say it. But I also met your insurance commissioner probably sometime last year. Uh, he was in Savannah, Georgia with my insurance commissioner who was literally key to us beginning our program in Georgia and was able to do this demonstration for him, and I, I think he was pretty blown away uh, by it. And so that's why I'm here today. You're going to be the doctors. And Les is down. He's examining himself. Just say he had a patient down there. But he's going to show you the capabilities of what technology can do now uh, and how this can really change your mind and change your way of thinking uh, as carriers or in the insurance industry, period, uh, how we can begin to to change things, especially here in Louisiana. And I will go ahead and go to my right ear. I don't see it, Les. Oh, there you go. <laughs> see, our docs, they, I mean, you can see this better than with a handheld otoscope. Believe you me, I've used them many times. The docs, I mean, they love it. They love it. And the patients, the first time they've ever seen their own ear. So when they're on that end, I mean, they're wowed. They love it. So I'm going to click off of that. I'm going to shake the end of my throat. So again, you can see kids with at school, they've got a throat infection, ear infection. I mean, these things can be, where do kids wind up going a lot of times to see a doc? Emergency room. Where is it the most expensive place to take care of them? The emergency room. This is really impacting kids. In Georgia, we had programs like REACH, Specialist on Call, which are all incredible programs. But our hospitals, they could not afford it. It was so expensive. Because us, you know, being a not-for-profit, we're trying to find things that work, that's cost-efficient, that's very effective. And so we were able to design a stroke portal, which any neurologist can utilize. And they can go in and do the NIH stroke scales. They can see these images with a matter of one to two minutes and they're able to see the patient and make diagnosis. So it's important that all of these things work together for your network to be successful. So uh, I wish all of you the very, very best. Anything that we can do uh, to help you, uh, we're, we're very available to do that. The great thing about our network, it is affordable, and really we can go anywhere we want to in the world. And uh, the Guatemala thing is exciting, but I mean, we literally, Nigeria, China, has been in my office. I mean, there is, I mean, it's, the infrastructure is there. It's just expanding a little bit to take on, uh, you know, these other applications. Because I truly believe everything is going to be app driven. You know, we're all going to be using iPads for just about everything we do or our phones. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how things are going. And if you keep somebody like Dr. Hines heading these things up, I know it's going to happen.